Good evening. Uh, my name is Keith Hillman. I have with me my good brother, Tom Scott. We teach the junior high boys at Kingsville Baptist Church. Been doing that a while and we're partners in crime, um, both at church and uh, in the woods and on the lake and uh, just enjoy a good friendship over many, many years. Um, we invite you today as we share the youth lesson. Um, We'll be in the book of John, chapter 4, several passages there. Specifically, we'll be looking at 7 through 14, 19 through 26, 28, 29, and then 39. Uh, the, the title of today's lesson is Jesus Teaches About Living Water. And uh, we'll, we'll have that discussion. Um, Tom, you know, it, it doesn't, um, you don't go too far in the day. And as you visit with people and hear conversations, you'll, find out pretty soon that people have a lot of desires, just the way that God made us, we were created, to have desires in life. And, you know, you start out with kids, and pretty soon you see them wanting toys or games or other things. And um, it goes on, teenagers, they, they desire those, uh, the, the peer approval at school. Uh, they desire to have those uh, certain relationships with people. And, and, uh, and just in general, as adults, we all put uh, priority on pursuing those things that we believe are going to give us satisfaction, that we truly we're think are going to make us happy. Always, yeah, we're always in search. I think all of us are, are in search of something. And, uh, and, we, and we think that uh, whether it's materialism or uh, through our education or through our jobs or whatever, that we find satisfaction. But it's, there's always that, that that continual thirst or a hunger for for more uh when you get it you know when you get that new that new whatever it is whether it's a boat a vehicle or whatever it is that uh eventually the the new wears off and, and you start saying well you know I, I i thought i would be satisfied with that and i i recall as a as a uh, child growing up how many times I, I i told my parents and as well as i i told god i said if you give me this, I'll be satisfied. And I wasn't satisfied. Yeah. Well, you know, God made us to hunger and strive uh, with the hope of satisfaction. Uh, so the question is, what do, you, what do we think will satisfy us? And of course, God wants us to find satisfaction, complete satisfaction, full satisfaction, happiness and joy in him and him alone. Uh, Tom, you want to open us up in prayer? Be glad to. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this time and, and, uh, that we have to study and, and to worship you in spirit and in truth, Father. And uh, you teach us about that today and teach us about uh, uh, where we can get that satisfaction, Father, through, its, uh, through knowing you and through having you in our lives. Father, help us uh, send your spirit to guide us, to watch over us, and to... Uh, uh, to minister to our souls, Father. Thank you, Lord, for Keith and for all that are working so hard during these challenging times to help to continue to bring about uh, normal worship. Thank you for all that you do for us, and thank you for our leadership of our church in Christ. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Tom. Yeah, we just want to tell you guys how much we miss you. Uh, those of maybe some of our junior high uh, guys are, are listening in, sitting in. We we hope they are. and. Uh, we, we, we pledge this, and when we do finally get to the point where we're back meeting, we're going to do some makeups on all the donuts. <laughs> we might have donuts for a whole month every Sunday. You know, there you go. They like that. Uh, but we sincerely uh, miss you guys, and we hope that you're doing well. Um, we sure do miss being uh, in fellowship, you know, being with you guys side by side, hearing what your thoughts are. and your concerns and uh, love to hear your answers and what's going on in your life. And hopefully we'll be able to get, get back to normal uh, fairly soon here. So again, if you want to turn in your Bibles, we're going to be in John chapter four. Uh, we're going to skip verses one to six. We'll come back and I'll, I'll give you a little background on those, but let's start off in verse seven. As I read there, <clears throat> a woman of Samaria came to draw water. Give me a drink. Jesus said to her because his disciples had gone into town to buy food. How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink, for, a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? She asked him, for Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who is saying to you, give me a drink, you would ask him and he would give you living water. 
Sir, said the woman, you don't even have a bucket and the well is deep. So where would you get this living water? You aren't greater than our father Jacob, are you? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and livestock. Jesus said, everyone who drinks from this water will get thirsty again. But whoever drinks from the water that I will give him will never get thirsty again. In fact, the water I will give him will become a well of water springing up in him for eternal life. Then uh, the woman replied, sir, the woman replied, I see that you're a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you Jews say the place to worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus told her, believe me, woman, an hour is coming when you will worship the Father. You will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know because salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Yes, the Father wants such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The woman said to him, I know the Messiah is coming who is called the Christ. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Jesus told her, I, the one you, the one speaking to you, am he. Then the woman left her water jar and went into town and told the people, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? Now many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of what the woman had said when she testified. He told me everything I ever did. Wow, some good stuff there. So uh, verses one through six, just to let you know what's going on, Jesus uh, and his disciples were in Judea and had made a decision to leave there and to go to Galilee. Well, guess what's in between Judea and Galilee? Samaria. Even worse than that, the Samaritan people. You see, the Jews despise the Samaritan people, uh, so much so that they avoided Samaria. They went around it. They would typically travel to the east, cross the Jordan River, and follow on the east side of the Jordan River and then cross back over to get to Galilee. So several hours out of the way. Uh, but they would choose that rather than have a direct route to the north to go from um, Judea to Galilee. So Tom, what are your, what are your thoughts on why Jesus in this event uh, chose the, this route? For he and his well, side? you know, logically it's the shortest route. But uh, it was also part of God's sovereign plan. And, uh, you know, God had planned this out for uh, these people to be, to be saved. And uh, I think about that route, and uh, it, it's almost like being in Lafayette and wanting to go to Natchitoches. And you don't want to go through Alexandria because of the people here. And you detour and you go and you cross the Mississippi River and go through Natchez and then cross the Mississippi River again, and then you end up in Natchitoches. But you go several, several, uh, uh, hours out of the way, and that's what the Jewish people would do. But uh, instead of going straight up I-49 and just being there in two hours. All right, good explanation. So let's ask the question and try to answer, who are the Samaritan people then? Um, since these were the bad people that the Jews despised, what was wrong? So they were considered to be half by the Jewish people. Their forefathers were Jewish, but they had intermarried with the Assyrians. Um, the Jews actually avoided contact and conversation, typically with the Samaritans. They just avoided them at any expense. Um, you know, many people today have prejudice against certain races, against nationalities, or certain classes of people, which is wrong, entirely wrong. The Jews were wrong even then, having that. And certainly, I think going back to why Jesus went through there, he didn't have any hate for the Samaritans. He loved everyone. He, he wanted to see everyone. He wanted to heal. Look who he associated with, taxpayers, the sick. He said, I came to, to heal the sick, not the ones that were well. So he didn't come to, um, to, to bow down to uh, rich uh, rulers or anyone like that. He was associated with everyone. To him, everyone was on a level ground, same playing field. He had no prejudice at all. 
So going back to the background, uh, Sychar is about halfway um, between Judea and Galilee, about midway in Samaria. And um, when he gets there, he is famished, okay? He has just, you know, traveled. Uh, he's hungry. He's thirsty, very thirsty. It's noon, okay? So I think it's important to point out these physical symptoms uh, because they help to verify and confirm his genuine, full humanity. You know, Jesus felt all, all the pains, all the circuits. He had headaches. He, had, he got sores. He got sore muscles. He got cramps. Yes, he, he felt the infliction that was put on him during the crucifixion, during the trial. He felt all those pains and all of full humanity. But so here he stops at the well. It's named Jacob's Well. Um, and you recall who Jacob was, a Jewish patriarch. He was the a son of Isaac, the brother of Esau. He had 12 sons. He got the 12 tribes of Israel. One of those sons was Joseph. And he gets there around the noon hour, hot, thirsty time of the day where you think there wouldn't be anyone else around. Tom, you got any other thoughts on this background scripture? <clears throat> Well, I, I think about the well, you know, Jacob's well, and when they dug that well, they had dug many wells, and many they had dug many dry wells. So that kind of tells us a little bit about that territory over there being kind of uh, uh, famished for water, you know. And uh, that was, the wells were very, very important uh, part of life, and it was a gathering place. Yeah, water was very important to them. It was a cherished one, if you could find it. Right well, more so if you find a shallow well, but uh, this was a deep well. Um, so let's notice who uh, uh, initiates the conversation with the Samaritan woman. Yep, yep, it was Jesus. So is this unusual? Well, you bet it is. Why? Well, remember that the Jews, they despised the Samaritan people or the half-breeds. They walked hours out of the way just to avoid going through Samaria, to avoid um, having uh, any interaction with these people. Uh, they actually thought that the Samaritan people stayed in a state of uh, defilement, just with their habits and the way that they were. So there was a lot of uh, conflict in, uh, there. Tom, so who is this Samaritan woman that Jesus asked for a drink of water? Give us a little bit about her. Well, uh, from what, we, what we're reading, it was uh, the midday. So generally, uh, the people would have gone earlier in the morning, in the cool of the morning, to, to get their water for the day. And uh, apparently, this woman has a past. Uh, maybe uh, you know that's that she's shunned by even even the people that, that she uh, lives around, and all. So she's probably got some uh, some sin in her life that uh, she's maybe an outcast or something of that nature. Um. So let's see how she replies to Jesus. She replies with a question. So how is it that you, being a Jew that you are, you asked me, a Samaritan woman, for a drink? Well, let me tell you what, this is what she's really saying. She said, hey, you Jewish guys, y'all don't like us, all right? So why are you even here? More so, why are you even communicating with me? She's well aware that this is so uncommon and a no-no for most Jews. So Tom, tell us how Jesus replies to her comment. Well, well the, uh, it says, if you know the, the gift of God and who is saying to you, give me a drink, you would ask him and he would give you living water. And uh, it's not the water that, uh, that, he's, that he's trying to get to. And uh, it was a, that was just a, a metaphor or a reference of uh, something that she could understand with. And, uh, you know, I've, I've, I've had that, that same feeling in my life. And uh, uh, when, I, when I recall when uh, Lori was going through her uh, uh, bout with cancer and all and, and the uneasiness and everything, and then I asked God for peace and, and joy, and, and he delivered that. And, and it was one of those things that uh, you, can't, you can't explain where it comes from, but it's just so wonderful when he gives you that, the Holy Spirit just gives you that comfort that uh, can't be given from anywhere else. Jesus really had a way with words in a way he could um, to bring people in. He did a really good job here with, with, with the water, the living water. 
So Jesus does answer, and in doing so, he tells her that he is the living water. Um, he is the giver of eternal life. He is the one that can completely satisfy all of the desires that we have. In us. So all of us are thirsty. We're all longing for something that will satisfy us completely. We're looking, we're searching, we're turning over every rock and uh, looking wherever we can. Sometimes we try to satisfy that thirst with sin. Uh, sometimes things that are inherently sinful. Sometimes we um, go to things that are idols that they become sinful when we put them in front of God, in the place of God in our lives. So how we each try to satisfy that thirst, it looks a little bit different for each person. Um, we're all unique. That, that's the way God made us and intended for us to be. But the need is still the same in each circumstance. And the need is that we need Jesus. We need a relationship with him. We need a connection with him. We'll find fulfillment, like just like you mentioned, Tom, you found the fulfillment when you got the bad news because he helped deliver you through that time. So that sweet, satisfying relationship we have with Jesus, that's the living water that God intends all of us to find in our own time. Yep, you know, this woman had messed up. Tom, you know, you mess up, I mess up, we all mess up. We, that's pretty common saying, I think, that everybody's yeah. got to realize and acknowledge that we're not without sin. Uh, Romans 3.23 tells us that we're all, all of sin and come all short of the glory of God. I love that little word. You tell me, I've said, told you often, I like that word, all. A little small word, it captures everything, doesn't leave out anything. Huh? <laughs> yeah, there's, 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 uh, there's nothing more to add to it. Yeah, that's right. So, Tom, wasn't there another story in the Bible that... Um, Oh, yeah, let me finish up that point. I was trying to make a point. So the lady messed up, but but and her sins had separated her from God. But Jesus recognizes, he knew this, being um, the king, the savior, the son of God, all-knowing, all-powerful. Uh, and with his loving compassion that he had and exhibited so, so often, he offered her an opportunity to fix that problem. And he does the same for you and I today. But Tom, so now wasn't there another story about Jesus and helping out a prostitute in the Bible? It was. it was. I think in John chapter 8, there was uh, one where uh, Jesus said they were getting ready to stone him mm -hmm. and all. And, and what's, so, what's so unique about it is that uh, we all mess up. And there is different, uh, as, as humans, we have a tendency to want to put uh, uh, a, a degree of of how bad it is that we mess up. It's like uh, in, in uh, the judicial system, you're punished certain lengths of time depending on the crime. Well, when it comes to sin, the, the, the same penalty for the little white lie is the very same as for murdering someone. It is death, and that's, that's the penalty of sin. And, and for uh, Christ, he, he comes and he tells that there's a way around this. And we are, we are, are, at in, are in enmity with God. We are his enemy because of sin. But he doesn't cast us out. He doesn't walk around us and, lead and, and go around, around where we're at. He comes to us and he asks us to join him. And, and, to, and to accept that gift of forgiveness. And that's what's so unique about this story and, and, uh, and how it's told over and over and over throughout the Bible in different ways that no matter what we have done, God promises us that if we turn to him, he will, he will carry us through and he will forgive us. Absolutely. You are right about that. Well, Tom, I guess we'll kind of shift um, from talking about the living water and kind of slide into um, the conversation that uh, Jesus and the Samaritan woman had uh, about worship because she, she brought up some points there and Jesus kind of um, straightened her out on that as well. Yeah, they uh, started talking about uh, the geography of worship. And, uh, well, you had to be at... Uh, uh, to go to, to d these certain places, you know, in, in the times that we're in right now, uh, our worship has been totally disrupted. Uh, 
because of COVID-19. Our churches have been shuttered. But in reality, our worship should not have gone down. We're worshiping right now. We're just doing it in a different way than we used to. I miss the fellowship piece. I miss being around others. I miss, uh, you know, being able to shake people's hand, give people a hug. But uh, I have, I actually feel through this whole thing that, that my worship has improved because I've had time to slow down a little bit and to, and to focus on God. So it's not about the, the geography of where it is in the spirit, because God is spirit, and that we worship in the spirit and in truth. Tom, you know, someone had to ask me, and I know we're all a little bit different, but we would all have a different opinion on the setting and the type of service that we should experience during, during worship. And um, I, I think that um, although it's good to have an opinion about what you would like to see and maybe what you enjoy, your preferences, I think that we still need to be open-minded, not um, um, you know, agree to disagree uh, with other folks because music has traditionally been a, a, a hot, hot bed for disagreement within churches and style of music. Me, I like a blend of traditional and the praise hymns. I like a blend. Some people like all the praise hymns. Some people may like all the traditional, you know, but man, just get up there and sing with all your heart. I just enjoy watching people raise their hands and you can just see them pouring themselves out in corporate worship. And I love to see that. But you know, like you were mentioning, we have personal worship on our own. When we, when we sit down and read scripture, allow God to speak to us through his word and through that time in prayer, that is worship. Um, you know, it's good to have the individual worship. It's good to have a small group worship time together, Bible studies, like we do on Sunday mornings and Sunday evenings. Um, and it's good to have the corporate. All of it, all of it glorifies God and gets him praise, which he's deserving and worthy of. Well, the two mountains, you know, she was arguing, uh, the Samaritan woman said, well, you know, a Samaritan's like this Jerusalem uh, mountain, I think is the place to worship. And uh, the Jews kind of preferred Mount Moriah as their place that um they thought that god should be worshiped but jesus straightened her out and said really it's not a you know i'm here with you now okay so you can worship now you don't have to go to any mountain <laughs> you can worship the king i'm with you right now i'm the messiah i'm the trumpet king I do, i'm going to deliver the people I, um i can restore i will restore all of creation uh i'm your salvation i'm your forgiveness um so when she learned about this, she went back into town and then she shared with her people. I think that's such a wonderful example of what we all should do when God does something special in our life. We become saved. I mean, she, she, she didn't even care water. Forget that she was going to get water, right? I mean, that's the purpose. She was so excited that she had such good news to share with people that she took him back to the village. And who would have thought that they would have believed a social outcast? I mean, you know, here's a lady that, didn't have a good reputation, right? So we're going to trust her that she's telling the truth. But what does Scripture 39 say? Verse 39 says that many of the people that heard her story believed, believed in the Messiah. So that's exciting to me and uh, kind of uh, jabs me a little bit to do a better job of praising God and sharing testimony when he does things that are great in my life, which he does quite often. And I know you've done the same thing. The time that you and Lori uh, shared the, uh, hosted the event at Louisiana College, Tom, and share what all had God had brought you through that time. That was a special worship time. And I think God was sitting up there smiling down and saying, that's the way to do it right there. Well, you know, um, we can, we, we can read and, and, and glean a whole lot from the stories throughout the Bible. And uh, they help to, to impart a lot of truth to us. Uh, but the best, the best testimony that I have is not what God did for this Samaritan woman. It's what God has done for me. It's about how God has delivered me when I didn't deserve it. It's about how God continues to, uh, to uh, discipline me he continues to uh, allow his Holy Spirit to, uh, to work in my life and to guide me and to tell me where I'm, where I'm, I'm failing and, uh, and calling me out on it. And 
when he does it, I've, I've got to be willing to share that. Uh, you know, it's kind of like uh, when when Lori did did get the news that uh, you know she was cancer free, and we had a celebration about that. We were wanting to tell everybody about that, and, t- and also tell the part about what God had done. But when you have a new, uh, like you recently, Keith had a had a new grandbaby. I've had grandbabies and. And uh, we want to share those pictures. We want to tell everybody about that. Well, we need to be willing to tell everybody about what God is doing in our lives every day. We have time. We just close to wrapping this thing up. God is a spirit. And to worship a spirit, we have to worship in spirit. We can do that because of Jesus and what he did on the cross. And because he overcame death and resurrected, then we have the Holy Spirit. And that gift, the gift of the Holy Spirit that we all have as believers, that allows us to worship in spirit and in truth. And that's the way that we have true worship of God. Um, so knowing God in, in truth through the, through the Holy Spirit. I, um, I think that's about all I was going to share. Tom, or you have any last comments before we close out? And thank yeah, you. I wanted to read this one last piece out of, out of our lesson. It says, the living water, the spirit that Jesus taught the Samaritan woman about satisfies completely. The Holy Spirit fills us with eternal life and helps us to worship our maker as we are in spirit and in truth. When we encounter Jesus as the Messiah and believe in him, we may receive and drink the living water only he can provide. And only through Jesus can we worship in spirit and in truth. He is the revelation of God because of the gift of God, of the Son of and the Spirit. We are motivated to share the good news with others so that they can believe and join in the worship he provides. You know, uh, I, I often think about Moses whenever he he tried to talk God out of using him. I can't speak well. I can't do all these other things. And God just kept saying, no, you're, you're the person I, I've, I've chosen. And, uh, and, you know, I find myself often trying to come up with an excuse of why I, 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 I can't. And, uh, and in reality, the, the Holy Spirit saying, just trust me, surrender and do what you're supposed to do. Do what I'm asking you to do. I'll give you every, I will enable you to do whatever it is that I'm calling you to do. Yeah, it's not about us, is it? It's about him yeah, trusting him. Yeah. It's a good time. Look, as we wrap up, we just want to tell you, thank you for joining us uh, during this time of uh, scripture and Bible study. We hope that uh, you've enjoyed this and we'll dig deep. And um, we'll meet back with you soon. But uh, thank you again for being with us this morning. We hope that you and your family stay well and that that we all can have that corporate worship, Bible study, and uh, meet together and hug and shake hands and do that fairly soon. Know that you're in our prayers daily. Um, Feel free to reach out to us uh, if you have any. We'd be glad to talk to you. So um, I'm going to close this in prayer and then we'll be dismissed. Father, thank you for this sweet time where we could read your word that reveals so much about your character and who you are and how we can please you and how we can worship you, God. So thankful for those folks that you use to get your word to us. Thank you for allowing it to be passed along so we could have it today. Let us not take it for granted. Let us open it, study it frequently, God, that we may grow as your disciples. We pray that those folks that have joined us this evening, their lives could be touched, Lord, by you, that they would trust in you just like the Samaritan woman did. She realized that Jesus was her source of forgiveness, her source of salvation. We thank you for that you do that for each of us, Father, that you save us from our sins. We don't have to do any special deeds. We don't have to do any works. We just have to simply trust, believe in you, and be your disciples. Thank you um, for all your blessings. Thank you for Kingsville Baptist Church, the leaders, the staff. We pray that you'd equip them to lead our congregation through these difficult times. We pray for our nation, uh, our state, uh, federal, local leaders, 
that you would give them wisdom in their decisions that they have to make in the days ahead. Protect all of our families from this fire as Father. Keep us well that we might be able to glorify you through words and deeds. Thank you for Jesus. Please forgive us. In his precious name we pray. Amen. Thanks again. God bless. See you soon. All right. Do you got to do the Vulcan way. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Thomas. I think it's done. All right. I'm glad we went ahead and did it. Maybe I'm not.